Welcome to the special Bloomberg Television debate. I'm Susan Lee. Today, we're going to try to tackle the question, ready for crisis. Is Asia ready? We had the uh, German Constitutional Court ruling on the ESM, but as we know, and the consensus is, the European sovereign debt crisis has a long way to go. Also, Chinese growth might be coming in at its lowest in 22 years. What does that mean for the world economy when you have the growth engine over the last decade declining? And of course, over in the U.S., we have the looming fiscal cliff at the end of this year. And we have a special panel of guests today from different backgrounds and industries to answer this question. So let's uh, get ready. First off, to my left, a man that really needs no introduction. It's good to be here. Um, the man who led one of the largest economies around the world, uh, the longest serving chancellor of the exchequer in UK modern history, the Honorable Mr. Brown. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Now, to his left, uh, for a view of one of the largest emerging economies across the Asia Pacific, of course, from India, we have uh, SP Shukla, who is the uh, president of global strategy at Mahindra and Mahindra, which is one of the largest, it is the largest tractor maker in the world and one of the uh, largest non-banking financial institutions in India. Good to have you with us. Delighted to be here. And of course, we need the Chinese view as well. And uh, an academic that is well known from one of the best universities across the country uh, and the former dean of the prestigious Guanghua School of Management, we have Professor Jiang Weiying joining us today. Now, we need a banking financial view, don't we? And, um, certainly. certainly do. <laughs> and the man uh, that represents the industry today for us is Mr. Rodney Ward, who is the chairman of investment banking and corporate lending at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Thank you a lot. And at the uh, end of our panel, finally, a man that also needs no introduction, Mr. Fred Hochberg, of course, who is the uh, head of the U.S. agency, the Export and Import Bank of the U.S., which helps these uh, <clears throat> industries that need financing that can't usually get it. Uh, get some money, some access right. to money. Good to have you with us. So we're going to start off this debate talking about the question at hand, ready for crisis. Is Asia Pacific ready for yet another global economic shock? Let's put that question to our panel now. And Mr. Brown, why don't you start us off? I hope, I hope we're not going to have another shock. Uh, I think that Asia has done remarkably well coming out of the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, and I think that we're going to see a slowdown in global growth. I think it is partly because we're in this transition from an economy that was previously dominated by the West to an economy where the center of gravity is uh, moving to Asia. Uh, and if you like, uh, the producers are in the majority in the emerging markets. The consumers are still in the majority in America and Europe. And we are having to deal with an unbalanced world economy as a result. My worry would be uh, financial. I don't think we've learned the lessons from the global financial crisis. I don't think we've got sufficient transparency in our financial system. I don't think we're able to track what is actually happening, uh, whether in a shadow banking system or in the formal banking system. I don't think that we've got standardized rules that should apply, in my view, to the whole of the global financial system. And that means that the next time there is a crisis, people will look back and say, why didn't we learn enough from what happened in America and Europe uh, during the global financial crisis and apply global financial rules uh, that gave us some standards uh, by which uh, all financial institutions should be working? So my fear is still that another financial crisis will arise because we have failed to deal with the problems that we knew uh, existed as a result of the last financial crisis. Mr. Shukla, you said five years on, we're still talking about crisis. Yes. Uh, let me first begin by saying that I'm an eternal optimist. And anyone who has studied economics, optimism itself decides and influences economics. I do believe, and I do get views from 150,000 employees in our group who come from 104 countries. All levels of preparedness are relative. So I speak right now for India only, not for Asia in general, and not for emerging economies at all. I think India is better prepared than many nations today to handle a financial crisis if it comes, though I hope, as Mr. Brown said, it doesn't come. We are better prepared. Why? I would say there are three factors we can take on that. One, 
it sounds very simple. But we are still growing at 5 to 6 percent. It may not sound much in the context of India, where we are talking about 9 and 10 percent, but it is still better than most of the world. Second, financial flows have slowed down. They have now to a small trickle. Nothing can go worse than that. Whether it is investment flows, portfolio flows, they are at such a low level now today in India, coming money coming in from outside, that it cannot possibly get worse than that. And third, if we talk about social tension, I'm covering the brief which you have given. In India, we do not have a social security. It is a handicap for the society, mm -hmm. but when seen in pure economic terms, in India, governments do not borrow to pay people who are not working. I'm putting it in economic terms. In social terms, it has many other implications. I'm not getting into that. So when that situation does not happen, there is no direct financial impact on government finances mm -hmm. of any such uh, uh, upheaval happening in financial markets. When you see these three factors together, we believe that our institutional systems are quite well prepared to withstand any shock if it happens at all. Professor Zhang. I think uh, uh, China is not yet ready. Uh, last decades, in terms of economic growth, China is the best decade. But in terms of uh, social problem, mm -hmm. It is a worst decade. In terms of uh, reform, it is a lost decade. Uh, so it's hard to understand this is why China has had high growth without uh, some fundamental reform in past decades. Uh, many people misunderstand it. They thought it's, we have already had good model, so-called China model. Now, what is China model? Government. Uh, uh, it's fair. The economy, state sector is very powerful. That's quite good. But actually, why, uh, my understanding is why China had grow, uh, high growth because China had uh, reform before, you know, uh, in the first two decades. That is very important because it's a reform dividend. China has enjoyed this reform dividend. What is the uh, the trouble is that last, because last decade is no fundamental reform. So China has already exhausted this reform uh -huh. dividend. So its next uh, uh, decade will be very, diff uh, I think very difficult for China. And uh, like uh, banks, they joined the big profit. They thought they are already efficient. They thought they already have good governors. But that's totally wrong. Mm -hmm. They are profitable because they enjoy monopoly because financial markets are not yet open. Some other state sector like China, uh, 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 telecommunication, like oil, they all enjoy monopoly. But they thought they are already efficient. So that is trouble. And also private sector, I think is uh, uh, many people, many uh, private business people are not very confident about the future. Because today they still face some uh, 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 government <coughs> policy, which is quite discriminate against the private sector. Uh, so I think this will kind of you know, not just the economic growth will go down, right. and also there will be some uh, I think uh, other troubles, particularly the how to change this institute. That is much depend on what uh, next generation or. or our next government we will do. Yeah, that's a bearish view on China that you have, Professor Zhang. Um, Ronnie, what's your view of well, the Asia Pacific? Thank you very much, Susan. I think, first of all, I would start off with the view that, unfortunately, I do think we're going to be in for another financial shock. And uh, I can't see, frankly, any easy way of avoiding that. Secondly, I would say that the financial shock that we've been talking about historically started in 2007 when the two best um, money markets effectively imploded. And 
So you've had five years already of, quotes, shock to deal with. And if you look at Asia and how Asia has survived those five years, it has actually survived those five years pretty strong and robust. When I look ahead and say to myself, what will happen in the future? I am very much persuaded by three or four basic factors. One, uh, Asia has the ability and flexibility on the monetary side. If you look at the EU, if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the US, they have zero interest rates. So they have no capacity, effectively, to have any easing. Uh, they're also in the EU locked into one currency, so they can't even allow their currency to take the heat. The great thing about Asia is they have the capacity, 3% plus uh, interest rates, to reduce interest rates, and they have floating uh, currencies which they can uh, uh, accommodate. They have uh, enormous fiscal uh, capacity. If you look at the US, I think the US debt to GDP ratio is around 90%, in Europe around 95%. If you look at the PRC, um, uh, it's something like 17%. Mm -hmm. If you add on the provincial debt, it might take you up to 40%, but it's still a huge difference. So, uh, and uh, I take China as the biggest economy, the others are even in more robust situation. So they have huge ability to inflate uh, uh, to, to ease, to stimulate their economies. And, uh, and that's a, a source of great comfort to me. And also the fact that they have major reserves, reserves that they've never had historically before, mm -hmm. record reserves throughout the region. Thirdly, demographics. Uh, Asia has got a young population. The one country that might have to worry about that, apart from obviously Japan, is China. China is coming up to its peak labor population in the next five to ten years. Apart from China, all the other countries have got huge, young, mobile people. What does that mean? One, not many old people, but those old people are not expecting entitlement <coughs> programs. The young people, much more mobile. Look at the EU. You would hope that with a common market, that there would be mobility, but there isn't because there's no language communality and labor laws are different. So when you look at that, Asia has a huge advantage on the demographic front. If you look at the banking side, I heard what my friend here said, 10 years ago, the banks were effectively organs of the state. They had loan loss ratios of something like 20% or thereabouts. Today, uh, if you look at the banks, their non-performing loans are less than 1%, and I'm talking about the big five banks, obviously. Less than, one uh, less than 1%. They have the capacity to lend, if you look at their loan-to-deposit ratio, huge capacity to lend, something like 58% uh, 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 loan-to-deposit ratio, where you would take 1% as, uh, or 100% as being mm -hmm. uh, relatively lent. So huge capacity there. And then finally, I think what we're missing here is huge growth of intra-regional trade, which means much less vulnerability to what's happening externally, and great growth in consumption. So those would be my comments. Okay. Fred, from the American perspective. I, I'm a little more optimistic. Um, you know, for decades, the global economy and the U.S. economy relied on the U.S. consumer and a lot of debt. That's changed. We're looking much more at an infrastructure play globally. The world's going to be invest north of $2 trillion a year. Uh, China has obviously led the way in infrastructure, but India, Vietnam, Indonesia are all putting in large infrastructure projects, building power plants, satellite systems, rail networks, airports. So I think we're looking for more balance. President Obama, in, in his national export initiative, said we need greater balance. Americans need to consume less, produce more. And I think that infrastructure is going to pick up some of that slack. And China is making an effort, as is much of Asia, on developing more of a consumer market. So I think longer term, medium term, three to five years, I think things are good. You know, I'm, I'm not so good at predicting six months at a time, but I think that <laughs> I think the trajectory and a lot of the marks are going in the right direction. 
Um, so I'm a little more optimistic than some might go panelists. <laughs> you are sounding very optimistic. But when we talk about crisis and financial shock, what, what type of shock could it be? Uh, are we talking about something political, say from Iran, Israel? Are we talking about the euro blowing up? What in particular, would, what crisis might be looming? See, I, I think we've learned over the last few years that you can have uh, a macroeconomic position that is relatively good. You can have low inflation in America and Europe. Uh, you can have uh, relatively stable uh, uh, growth. Uh, but if underlying it there is a financial weakness, then things can go very, very wrong. Uh, so if you'd looked at the inflation figures, if you looked at the growth figures, uh, you might have thought they were growing too fast, but you would have, uh, you would have thought that uh, the kind of crisis we had in 2008 would not have happened. And so we've got to be very careful uh, in, to look at the volatility within the financial system. Uh, and I, I think I agree with the, the rest of the panel that if you look at the macroeconomic position, we're going to have lower growth uh, globally. It is going to affect uh, China and uh, the rest of uh, Asia. The reason is primarily that Europe and America is not, uh, they're not recovering as quickly as they, they should have, and they're not consuming as much uh, and have got themselves to export, as uh, was just being said, if they're going to be a, a balanced and uh, strong growth economy in the future. Uh, so on the macroeconomic picture, you can see problems, but you don't see crises uh, at the moment. But on the financial side, I think we've got to be very wary after the experience of 2007-8. Things look good on the surface, uh, and you've got to dig down all the time and look at what is really happening, what are the underlying trends that are happening. Now, I accept everything that's been said, that China has got uh, very big reserves, uh, that uh, the, uh, the defaults and the, uh, and the bad uh, debt uh, uh, ratios look uh, as if they're the underperforming uh, assets, look as if they're not a problem at the moment. Uh, but I do uh, sense that we haven't uh, applied the lessons that we learned in 2008. You see, when we set up the G20, uh, in 2008 to manage the crisis, we had three aims. The first was to get to prevent a depression, and we managed to do that. The second was to repair the financial system, and the third was to get back to stable global growth. And the second and the third have not been fully achieved, and it's the second that worries me most, because in the last two years, while we committed ourselves to global standards and global rules, what we've actually had in practice is each national regime deciding to go its own way. And so instead of having a, a common pattern and a common playing field around the world in the management of our financial systems, America is doing one thing, part of Europe is doing another thing, the rest of Europe is doing another thing, Asia is doing another thing. And I think in that lies huge risk for the future. And that's what I would be most worried about, that you can look on the surface and see that things are going very well, but in practice, you've got to dig down and look at how uh, uh, resources are being allocated, what risks people are actually taking. And even if you have very substantial reserves, you've got to still worry. Uh, because as we knew, the debt ratios, in, uh, the, the government debt in, in Europe was not that high at the beginning of the crisis. It is exploded uh, uh, because of the crisis. And it's mainly because of a financial crisis that is fed through to the real economy. But can I just say that on the financial crisis, I mean, it's very interesting. If you look at the assets to GDP ratios in, say, Switzerland, mm. they are 470%. If you look at the UK, even the UK is something like 400 plus percent. Mm. If you look at the US, it's just 70%. If you look at China, I think it's about 150%. Mm. So there's something wrong when so much of the assets are actually being deployed in non-productive means. And I'd be interested in you, your views on that as Chancellor, as whether or not you don't feel that means inevitably for the foreseeable future that certainly Switzerland and maybe the UK will have to shrink and continue to shrink their banking systems because they're unsustainable as they are at the moment. Well, some, some countries, as you know, have uh, uh, international uh, finance at the heart of their economy, and therefore it's bound to be the case. I know. Uh, bound to be the case that uh, the banks have uh, major, major liabilities. Uh, but of course, 
you've got to look at the regulatory system in each uh, country. And the lesson, of course, we've, uh, we've learned uh, in the United Kingdom is that uh, we should have been tougher in our regulatory system. Uh, but the lesson I learn more generally is that unless you have a level playing field around the world, <coughs> then there is always a danger that the problem will move from one place to another. And I don't think we've thought that through. We've got a global financial stability board. We've got a G20 set of recommendations. But let's be honest, they're not being followed at the moment. And we don't have uh, global financial standards that we can be proud of. And I, I keep saying, people will say, the next crisis, why didn't you deal with it in the last crisis? And let's be honest, we have not yet dealt with these problems. If I can come in there, you made a very interesting point about the regulation of the financial markets. Yeah. I think, again, I bring the perspective from India, a large emerging market. When it comes to housing finance, which caused many of the problems in the world, None of the banks in India will loan you unless you put 30% upfront for your house. Only after that the lending begins. Bank has absolutely no risk. They cannot lose money on lending money for any house. Now, it may keep the growth little lower, but risk to the banking system does not exist. Similar things prevail. Our central bank has been so conservative that in its effort to balance growth and uh, controlling inflation, it has been raising interest rates for almost two years. Mm -hmm. Today in India, uh, companies pay anywhere from 9% to 12% rate of interest, depending upon the rating of the company. That gives a, that's the point Rodney made. That gives so much leverage to the country that tomorrow if government were to take a view to stimulate the economy, a country where people are used to paying 9% and 12% interest rate, even if you were to shave off 2%, that is a whole good kicker for the economy. But of course, RBI is, Reserve Bank is balancing the inflation expectations and therefore keeping the rates high. There are so many reserves in place which can be released if the need be. But the bigger problem I see for the emerging economies is that they do not have enough capital formation. And they still depend a lot on external flows. And that is where risk lies to countries which have to import foreign capital to develop their own infrastructure. So while pent up demand, both for consumer goods as well as capital goods and infrastructure is very high in India. If Financing of those needs does not happen. That may become a constraint in growth, but by no means it will lead to any crisis. Professor Zhang? I think uh, uh, China, why China had no financial crisis when global had financial crisis? Because uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Zhu Yunji solved that problem before global financial crisis. Mm. He used the state budget and he used the foreign reserve uh, eject uh, big money into all these uh, big four uh, banks, yeah. commercial banks. That was very important. But now I think it's uh, 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 next few years will be, I think, something change. Uh, particularly, I think, uh, you know, more and more companies face a problem. They call the pay debt and the non-performance law will increase. I, I think the Chinese banks will also face new problem mm -hmm. of non-performance debt. Not, not so good as today. The only thing I would say about that, and I understand the point, is that the capital adequacy ratios of the banks in China have been substantially enhanced. Pre-Basel III, they're still up to 12 to 13 percent. That's huge change from where we were 10 years ago. Um, so capital adequacy, uh, the strength of their balance sheet, the strength of their non-performing loans. There is a shadow banking system, you're absolutely right. That probably accounts for 30 odd percent of the lending in China. But that is really targeted at SME, smaller organizations, which frankly the bigger banks are just not equipped to deal with. It doesn't mean that those shadow banking loans are bad loans. Mm -hmm. Many of them are very good loans. It's just that, unfortunately, for the very big banks, they don't move the needle in financial terms. I was just going to add, I think that you know, Europe and Asia 
have the financial wherewithal, as well as the United States, to solve its problems. It's a question of political will in different parts of the world. So, I mean, it's not a lack of capital. It's not a lack of resources. It's a question of how voters perceive it, how leadership shapes that so that people can have a common purpose and move forward on that. That's true in Europe. That's true in the United States. You know, we have, a, we have some budget and deficit and fiscal issues. <clears throat> it's a question of President Obama has a view. Uh, Republicans have a view, how we find common ground and move forward. So it's more about finding common ground, whether that's in Europe or whether that's in the United States, and whether that's as China evolves into more of a consumer economy, it's a question of moving in that direction. So I think that the resources are there. It's a question of whether people are going to move there. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Brown, you said that uh, we could be on the precipice of another crisis, and we haven't learned the lessons from the past. Can you share with us, back in 2008 when the financial crisis hit as a prime minister of the UK, what lessons did you learn, and what would you tell Asian leaders right now to do to prepare for another shock? Are they doing the right things, in your view? Maybe i give an example. I was at a meeting of the Euro group. That's the, all the leaders of the countries in the Euro in October 2008 just after Lehman Brothers had collapsed. And Britain was not part of the euro, as you probably know. But I was invited to the meeting because we had just recapitalized our banks. And we went round the table and listened to every European leader uh, talking about their individual uh, position. And they said, all of them, that this was uh, an American crisis. It was Anglo-Saxon, if you like. Britain had made a mistake because it, it had gone uh, with a similar financial system to that of America. And Europe was really uh, being infected by what had gone wrong in America. And the assumption was that there was very little wrong in Europe uh, and that if only America would sort out its problems, then thing would, things would be fine. And it was only uh, over a period of years that Europe came to recognize that, first of all, its banks were actually more highly leveraged than those of America. We just talk, talk, talked about, about that. Uh, and clearly also it had a competitiveness and growth problem which is still not resolved, that Europe's got a smaller share of the world economy now uh, as, as a result of the rise of uh, Asia, of course, but Europe is not sending enough exports to the dynamic emerging market sectors of the world and therefore Europe is facing a, a problem about its ability to grow. Uh, and, and what I'm really describing here is that uh, even as the crisis hit the world, uh, Layman's had gone, Bear Stearns had been months uh, before, uh, there was still not a recognition that things were quite uh, 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 fundamental uh, and had to be sort sorted out. So you've got to think very clearly uh, all the time, that's the lesson I learned, about what are the weaknesses and vulnerabilities in your economy. Now, what's going to happen in Asia over the next few years is something that the world really has never seen before. We're going to see the rise of the the global middle class. The middle class will be a majority of the world's population by 2030 if, uh, if, if, if we're right in the predictions we've made. Most of the expansion is in Asia. 40% of global consumer spending will be in Asia in 10 years' time, only 20% of it in America. So you've got this massive expansion taking place. And as that expansion takes place, you've got to be certain that your financial fundamentals are strong. And I accept that um, Asia, uh, particularly China, of course, has very big reserves. And therefore, you can fall back on uh, reserves if things start to, to go wrong. Uh, but I'm not certain uh, that faced with this massive expansion, huge amount of foreign investment coming into Asia, an equity market that is not as strong as the rest of the world, banks being relied on more than in other parts of the world to lend money to businesses, the need of businesses who are expanding to get finance, I'm not so sure that you can say definitely that all the issues in the financial system uh, have been thought about uh, and can be dealt with. And that's really the point I'm making, that you could be sitting here thinking things are fine, but underneath uh, there are issues in the financial system that we found out about in Europe too late, and America found out to its cost with a terrible shock. Uh, but at that time, it seemed reasonable to invest in housing. In retrospect, it was a mistake to allow the subprime market to develop. And so look at the fundamentals, look at how strong they are. Uh, and I'm absolutely sure when I look around uh, the financial system, 
that not enough has been done to learn the lessons of 2008. So that's, that's what I mm -hmm. draw from my own experience. Yeah, Professor uh, John, I, I just wanted to tap uh, your view of China because you are very bearish, basically saying that the next 10 years are questionable for Chinese growth. Are, are you saying that China's headed for a crash right now? Uh, I would like to say, uh, I think we need to learn right lessons from all this uh, crisis. Uh, in uh, 1997, 1998, that was the East Asian financial crisis. And we learned the right lesson that the government interfered too much, controlled too much, chronic capitalism. But in this global uh, 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 crisis, we learned the wrong lessons. People, most, many people saw this market failed. So government has done quite a lot. Uh, but I think the uh, causes of global crisis was the government printed too much money, too low interest rate, you know, too many people spend too much money, that's my problem. But today we use this wrong method <laughs> to solve this problem. That will be, I think, a, co a major cause for our future trouble. That the trouble will come from current government policy. Yes. I was thinking if we look at more social economic context rather than financial context, then some of the issues of emerging economies will be uh, more crystallized in the mind. India has been getting growth. So have many other large economies in the emerging world. The problem is less of a growth and more of inclusive growth. You talked so well about the rise of middle class. We need a far bigger middle class than what we have today. It is still a small proportion of overall economy. So while we talk about India's middle class being 200 million strong, what we forget is that it's a 1.2 billion people, often people call it billion people, but I keep correcting them that you're forgetting 200 million. This is 1.2 billion people. Now 200 million is too small a part of overall economy still. There are many, many others who deserve to be there who ought to be there and are not yet there. It is this aspect which is what is holding back economies like India. And that is what leads to lack of formation of consensus on urgent economic reforms. There is something which one has to remember that we have to first live in the present before we think about the future. So very often, while building economic consensus on any matter, Concerns of present have to be taken care of, and the sections, the interest which represent those sections, they will vociferously put forward the point, and as a result, present wins against the future in many of the initiatives, in many of the discussions. Mm -hmm. It is that which I believe is an outcome of slowing economic growth. I'm not talking here about crisis. I'm talking about constraint. As a result, growth which could be achieved by economies like India on a pure economic rationale sometimes is partly sacrificed because present has to be taken care of of those who have not yet made it to middle class. This is a reality and I do believe that fine tuning will go on at various levels to handle this. We're going to make this a very interactive session as well. So there will be a question and answer period where we invite the audience uh, to ask questions to our panelists. But uh, please wait for a microphone to get to you, introduce yourself, and then ask your question. Um, so we have microphones roaming right now. Would anybody like to ask a question? This lady in front. Lin Li from Peking University. Uh, my question is for Mr. Brown. Uh, I know you, had done, you did a great job during the crisis, also you share your experience with the Chinese. Uh, uh, allow me to say more, is I don't very much agree with Mr. Zhang's <laughs> opinion because he seems quite uh, pessimistic. I'm, I'm more optimistic about China's future. Actually, I think nobody ready for the crisis. Uh, the key thing is how, what's the ability to deal with the crisis? 
I, I believe Chinese government and the Chinese, they have the ability they are, uh, to deal with the crisis. They are quick learner. They are hungry to learning, and the answer, they work very hard. But back to the question for Mr. Brown is, uh, during the crisis, you know, what you want to do and what you can do, given the political structure in the Britain, and the compare with the Chinese political system, so what advice you can give to the Chinese people for the future crisis? Or maybe my question is not clear enough. Is if you, suppose you are the Chinese leader, <laughs> what do you deal with the crisis? Thank you. I, I know the Chinese are choosing new leaderships at the moment, but I don't think I'm being considered. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think what you're, you're, you're asking is, is really relevant. It, I sense that the uh, Chinese uh, leadership and the Chinese uh, uh, economics uh, 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 leaders particularly uh, are thinking very carefully about the next 5, 10, 15 and 20 years. Uh, and uh, you may have seen a report that was published jointly with the Chinese government and the World Bank uh, called China 2030. And it itemized all the challenges that China has to face in a way that I think uh, was very honest and upfront about inequality being a major problem in China, the education system being in need of uh, reform and improvement, uh, and having to move faster to get children into secondary school and to get secondary education, and then the ambition, I think, of having 300 uh, million uh, university graduates by 2030. Uh, and then it did look at the financial system as well, and some of the problems that I'm raising were actually raised in, in the report itself about how the financial system could cope with this massive expansion. So I, I think it's to China's credit that you are uh, not taking a short-term view, you're taking a long-term view, and that uh, you understand the social and economic changes uh, that are needing to be made, uh, rural wages, uh, the loss of manufacturing jobs which were relocated to other countries where wage levels are at the moment lower than those in China, the need to replace these with knowledge intensive, capital intensive, uh, uh, more technologically sophisticated jobs for the future. So yes, yes, I think, I, I think that my, my caveat about financial volatility and the need to be more cautious about the, the problems that arise from that which can surprise you uh, is understood in that report. Uh, but I think the phenomenal growth of China over the next 10 years is actually going to be something even greater than we've seen in the last 10 years. And the development of the Chinese middle class uh, will, of course, be probably drive the consumer patterns of not just uh, China and Asia, but drive consumer patterns of spending right, right across, across the world. Uh, but that means big change, and that means you've got to be prepared uh, for the financial aspects of that, as well as the social and economic uh, changes that are taking place. Well said. Uh, next, yes, the gentleman over here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dheeraj Nair. I'm from India. Uh, I'm a journalist. My qu question for Professor Zhang. Uh, I've been here in China for six days, and uh, what I've gathered is that the situation facing the new leadership now is different from the earlier leaderships. One factor is social media, so people are expressing the discontent more. Second is that China's export run, investment run model is run out of steam. Doesn't that reduce the ability to deal with a crisis should it come in the next five years? What is it about the new Chinese leadership which will be different given that they've grown up in the same system over the last 30 years? How will they deal with these new factors, whether technological or economic? Uh, uh, I once said that two things are most important. First, the ideas. What kind of ideas you have, what do you believe? Second is leadership. Uh, if we uh, think about China's problem in terms of these two issues, a uh, lot decades, I think China lost its ideas. Before that, you know, China had very strong ideas you know, how to reform. Uh, or how to have uh, market-oriented reform, but in the last decades, you know, people thought very differently, including leaders thought very differently. That is why we lost, I call it, uh, we lost decades. And also, uh, I think you know, today it's more difficult for China's leaders uh, to have enough authority. 
Uh, even they have good ideas. Uh, they, have, they may have no enough authority to do that, uh, to do that, uh, uh, yeah, what they want. That's also a uh, 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 problem. But I hope next uh, uh, leaders uh, will do something, I think, differently. Particularly, China needs to restart uh, interrupted uh, reform, particularly like privatization of state sectors. Uh, that is, I think, uh, only when you, know, you give more resources to private sectors, let those private entrepreneurs be more confident. And China will certainly, I think, have a good future. I'm not very pessimistic. I just means everything depends on leadership and ideas. What you will you do? You know, if you just continue current policy, I think it will be wrong. Uh, China will have no good future. Yeah. So that is the argument I like yeah. to give. Change with the times. Yeah. Yes, this lady over here. Thank you. I'm from uh, Phoenix, Venice. I have one question to ask Mr. Brown. And as we all know, the dispute island between China and Japan is very seriously now. And what do you think the change and how to prepare for this crisis? Thank you. Between China and Japan. <laughs> well, um, so this has to do with the uh, political yeah. entanglement yeah. over of disputed course. islands. Of course. Uh, look, look, in any uh, region of the world, as, uh, as you find, there are periodic disputes about territory, about uh, uh, historical events that are misunderstood and have to be reinterpreted, uh, about historic uh, uh, problems that have never been properly uh, solved. The question is not whether there will be these disputes. This is bound to happen. And where there are natural resources involved, uh, the disputes are likely to be um, uh, quite uh, immediate and, uh, and, and, and obviously uh, they, they involve a lot of uh, uh, resources and finance. The question is whether you can solve these disputes. And we have painfully in Europe uh, had to find means by which we resolve disputes between countries that historically had uh, a history of, of grievance and uh, animosity. And I think uh, the question in Asia is whether the mechanisms that you are developing for regional cooperation uh, are going to be effective in working in the future. Uh, and there are many attempts, of course, at regional economic cooperation. Uh, many attempts also have been made for security cooperation. Uh, and I believe that you will find over these next few years that the, the pressure to resolve these disputes amicably in the interest of preventing either a loss of uh, income or uh, uh, preventing uh, uh, further uh, damage uh, will, be, will be great. So I, I think what will happen is that you will develop over a period of time far better mechanisms for dealing with these disputes. And the lesson from the rest of the world is that that is something that should be given priority uh, because you do not want to let problems that are uh, obviously there get, get out of hand. So I look forward to seeing these mechanisms for cooperation developing more successfully over the next few years. Yes, this gentleman. Um, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um, Gerard Lyons, I'm Chief Economist at Standard Chartered Bank based in London. The question I'd like to ask is about inclusive growth. Um, after the financial crisis, the annual meeting in the Asian Development Bank highlighted that for Asia to move from export-led to domestic driven growth, it needed three things. Deep and broader bond markets, help to small medium firms to create jobs, and also a social safety net to discourage people from saving too much and to encourage them to spend more. I'd like to ask uh, former Prime Minister Brown whether he's got any lessons he thinks from Britain and Europe that Asia should heed about setting up a social safety net. And the other four speakers as to whether they think Asia can afford the sort of social safety net it might need in the future. Thank you. Well, one of the fascinating pieces of research that has been done recently, and this is about the whole world and not just Asia, is how little it would take uh, to remove everybody in the world from absolute poverty. Because we've made huge advances, and principally in China, in taking people out of poverty, then it is possible with a limited amount of resources to guarantee people that they would be out of the 
uh, absolute poverty that uh, still afflicts uh, about 1.4 billion uh, people. As far as uh, safety nets are concerned, I mean, 80% of the population of the world is not covered by a safety net at the moment. Uh, but I see all the uh, developments in, in India with the, the guaranteed income, and you may dispute how it is actually working in practice, but the idea uh, in China with uh, the provision of pensions, with the provision of health care, uh, I see all these uh, uh, innovative ways of trying to, to, to develop a proper safety net. And I think it comes back to this uh, question, how much uh, inequality uh, are we prepared to, uh, to tolerate without act acting? And there is no doubt that inequalities got worse and worse in the world. Uh, some people argue that that is one of the causes of the financial crisis, the pressure particularly on the American middle class to borrow money because they had very little uh, additional earnings uh, as most of the wealth in America in the last 20 years went, or the additional wealth went to those at the very top. So, so there is this uh, issue about inequality and, and whether it is detrimental to growth and you get to a certain level of inequality in your economy uh, that is actually uh, threatening uh, the stability of your, your society. And I think that is a serious question that's going to be dealt with in Asia. So progress on removing poverty, and we now know we could do a lot more, uh, but for uh, an acceptable amount of money to get people out of absolute poverty. Progress in safety nets, and of course, you know, the, there are different models. The British National Health Service is uh, a taxpayer-funded healthcare system where health is free, but uh, other systems are private-public partnerships or simply private. Uh, but I think uh, we've got to get to this question of... Uh, what level of inequality is, is, is acceptable or unacceptable in a modern economy and at what point does it actually uh, damage the efficiency of the economy and the stability of your society. Uh, and I know in China that the levels of inequality are now similar to the levels of America. Yeah. Uh, and that is, I think, something that you've got to worry about. And I know in India that levels of inequality have got substantially uh, worse. Uh, and therefore, that is a problem about social stability, of course, as well as a problem about what effects it has on economic efficiency. And it would be really good, I think, if we could have a, a genuine open debate uh, about the acceptable levels of uh, inequality as well as the need for social safety nets and to deal with poverty. The only thing I would add to that, though, I must say, is if you look at the United States today, you have got baby boomers of around 28% coming towards their entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, and all those related things. And the reality is that this comes at a time when the United States has very little room in which to pay for these programs. So I actually think that you're going to find, and it's the same in Europe for different reasons, the social security entitlement programs are not affordable. And so we're going to have to make some very tough choices. And I think those very tough choices will involve a curtailment of some of these uh, very... Uh, I won't even say they're very generous, but some of these programs. If I can come in here, social security has to be seen from the point of view of what is it we are talking about. There is a gross problem of unemployment. And what am I doing? I can't uh, uh, tell anything new to a chief economist, but I'll make an attempt. Is the problem giving food to the people or is the problem giving work to the people? So in India, social security has been devised that food for work program. What the government has done in last two years is a rural employment guarantee scheme named after Mahatma Gandhi. And it says that in every family, one able person will be entitled to that many days of work in a year which will be guaranteed to him in rural areas and for that certain minimum wage will be paid. It is a work guarantee program and not a non-working work guarantee program. So government is not borrowing money to keep people who may be working, not working, out of choice, out of compulsion, I do not know. But if they do not have work, government will guarantee them work certain number of days in a year and they will get paid certain minimum wages and they have an incentive to keep looking for work which is better paying so that they move out of this minimum wage program to a better paying program. 
I believe that social security is far superior to a social security which says you don't work, I will pay you so much every week or so much every month. So you keep borrowing across the generations uh -huh. or you keep transferring from those who work to those who don't work. We are in the last five minutes of our debate, so we have to uh, sum this conversation up now with our panelists. And uh, I'm going to end this conversation looking forward and also maybe taking in the present as well. We're going to start uh, with Mr. Hochberg at the end. What keeps you up at night right now, and uh, how do you see that playing out in the future? <laughs> what keeps me up at night? Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the world, and when there's uncertainty, people don't make decisions. And I think that's what's immobilizing. I think from the European debt crisis to some of the issues facing the United States is immobilizing business people from making decisions, government leaders from making decisions. And I think that's, that's what keeps me up, a lack of decision. We're better off making some decisions and moving forward and having some mid-course corrections than simply being immobilized and not making the proper decisions, whether that's in China about moving more towards a consumer economy, whether it's about putting the right infrastructure in place so therefore more people in India have power. Uh, all of those, those types of programs, we need to just go, move forward, and I think that's what keeps me up at night. Yeah. Mr. Warren, brief final thoughts? I think the thought of listening to you at 6.30 in the morning is one of the more daunting things that keeps me awake <laughs> in the morning. Uh, aside from that, it would be, to be honest, uh, some of these fat tail risks that we've been talking about. What happens if the euro cannot be resolved? How long can we kick this horrible situation down the road? And I don't think it can be for, for very much longer. What is going to happen in the United States where you seem to have a paralysis of government? And you see that in the disaffection of people generally around the world. I don't see extraordinary exuberance or euphoria. You get euphoria one day and gloom the next day. And I think people are having a real concern about the organs of government and their effectiveness. And what can we do to rekindle the confidence of people that actually government is working for them sensibly and intelligently to resolve some of these huge problems that we're looking at? Professor Zhang. I think the, the most serious crisis we face today is not economic, but uh, leadership crisis. Everywhere, there is no real leadership. America, European, China, same. And we need people like uh, Ronald Reagan, Mrs. Thatcher, Gordon Brown, and Deng Xiaoping. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, I think, most important. Those people have very great ideas. But currently, I think it's uh, everywhere. We have politicians. No, they just deal with a very short-term problem. They will create more problems. No, that's trouble we will face. Wow, I'm sorry. Shukla, how do you follow that? Yeah. <laughs> that's very really good. Actually, business confidence is one of the most important things needed today in most economies. Most of the large companies, at least in the country I come from, are sitting on large piles of cash and hesitating to invest. On the other hand, small medium enterprises have lack of access to capital because interest rates are high. And interest rates are high because we want to control the inflation and keep the financial systems robust. When you look at all things put together, what it comes down to is that we have imported successfully many of the worries of the global system, and rightly so. Business confidence will only improve if there are signs of government giving stimulus to the economy, and government will feel confident only if it sees its revenues rising and inflation coming down. So it has become a vicious cycle of one thing feeding upon another, mm -hmm. and something has to give to break the cycle and get things going again. Mr. Gordon Brown? Well, I think what will keep people awake at night is listening to pessimism if we, <laughs> <laughs> if we can do I, I'm actually far more optimistic about the future. Uh, I, I, if we can solve the problems that we've talked about, and they are real, financial volatility, the euro uh, problem, I, I think probably the biggest problem, the lack of global coordination, which is perhaps what, what, what you, you're referring to in, in our policy making, when we do have a global economy, then the level of technological progress in this world is such 
the advances being made in medical science uh, are such. Uh, the dynamism of the entrepreneurs that we see around the world is such that you can only be optimistic about the future. So it's a question of solving what are practical problems to enable the technological genius, the medical advances, the entrepreneurial flair uh, to, to make a real difference to the quality of life and the standards of living of millions of people who stand ready to benefit from the changes that can be brought about over the next few years. So for these reasons, I would be optimistic about the world, but it is a challenge, as I think you rightly said, both to politicians uh, and to those interested in the public good to deal with the real problems that we have and not to ignore them or avoid them or, or bury your head in the sand. If we can do that, I think we should be optimistic. Mr. Gordon Brown, Mr. S.P. Shukla, Professor Zhang, Ronnie Ward, Mr. Hochberg, thank you so much for your time and taking part in this uh, special Bloomberg television debate at the World Economic Forum. And thank you all for attending today. That does it for uh, this conversation on Ready for Crisis. Uh, our Asian growth markets are ready for another global economic shock. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.